Athletic Brewing Company is reimagining beer for the modern active adult. Their great tasting athletic craft brews let you enjoy the refreshing taste of craft beer without the alcohol or the hangover. You can enjoy them anytime, anywhere, and still be healthy, active, and at your best. And win AB1 North American Brewer of the Year at the International Beer Challenge, the judges were shocked to find out it was alcohol free. I mean, seriously? Buzz-free beer that is better than the rest? And to top it all off, as part of Athletic Brewing, two for the Trails program, 2% of all their sales are donated to causes and organizations that support healthy, outdoor, active living through park and trail cleanup and maintenance. Whether you've decided to cut alcohol out of your life for good, for a night, or just one drink, Athletic Brewing Company provides an option without compromises that you're guaranteed to enjoy. To try their award-winning non-alcoholic beers, go to athleticbrewing.com. Use the code PNF20. You'll save 20% off your first order. There is free shipping on orders of two six-packs or more, or you can use their store finder to find it on shelves near you. Athletic Brewing. Brew without compromise. This segment is brought to you by Jigmasters. Step up your game with high quality performance jigs, spinner baits, buzz baits, and more from Jigmasters.com. And always, when in doubt, get the jig out. You're listening to Bad Fishing for Moves on the Paddle and Fan Podcast with your hosts, Ryan Milford and Sean Lambert. Welcome back to Bass Fishing for Noobs on the Paddle and Fin Podcast. I'm Ryan. Got my co-host in here, Sean. Hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing tonight, Sean? I'm doing fine. I'm glad it's a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Monday. This episode comes right, out. Yeah. Right, you're right. <laughs> Nobody's fine. <laughs> uh, tonight, we have Mr. Bailey... Egg Brit. I, I <laughs> <don't know>. We <laughs> just so talked close. about this. We just talked about Egg Brit. There yeah, you go. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Brit. Yeah. We just talked about this before we started recording. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Terrible. Everyone, everybody messes it up. Dude. Everyone listening from Tennessee, Ryan threw y'all under the bus. He's like, I'm going to mess this up because I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> uh-huh. That's not quite what I said. But yeah. yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you don't know Bailey, Bailey's from the Serious Angler podcast. Really good po- podcast and, uh, you know, very informative, especially like when you get into, you know, talking electronics and offshore fishing and all that and crazy. And, you know, we'll get into that some here because uh, and I, I, I'm really going to need Bailey to dumb some of that stuff down. Sometimes I hear them talking about it and I'm like, what are they even talking about right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but yeah, uh, welcome to the show, Bailey. Um, if you don't mind, you know, for people that don't know you, you know, I done said you're from the Serious Angler podcast, but give a little more detail on who you are and, you know, what you do and all that good stuff. Heck yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I'm Bailey Eichenbrett, uh, like Ryan mentioned from Serious Angler podcast. Um, I'm from New York, so I'm sitting here staring at. Five six, five, six inches of ice right now, unfortunately. Still patiently waiting on that, that open water season. But uh, I'm 23 years old. I live in the, the heart of the Finger Lakes, some, uh, some amazing country up here to fish for brown and green fish. And uh, just recently, in the past two months, started my own uh, media company, kind of doing everything across the board that uh, I couldn't use with my master's degree. <laughs> Because uh, the athletics industry pretty much uh, got tanked with COVID. So I decided to uh, go out on a limb and do my own thing. And hopefully it'll afford me some flexibility to fish as much as I want. So it uh, might have been a blessing in disguise. But, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's been uh, – I was talking to Sean. I haven't had the opportunity to actually talk to Sean uh, ever over social media. Like, Ryan, we spoke over social media before, but never – it kind of in relative terms face to face here, but uh, it's been nice to, to sit down with you boys and talk some fishing. Yeah, well, well thanks for coming on again. That's awesome. Um, I, you know, I, 
I I've listened to the Serious Angular podcast for a long time, uh, but and you know it's it's weird how you know, you know I've talked to a bunch of people our, cro- our paths have never crossed crossed, but um, you know you definitely feel like you know listening to a podcast over a length of time you get to know the person and um, you know but getting to actually sit down with you is pretty cool. So thanks for coming on. Likewise, yeah. And, and you know it's pretty bad, Sean. Like. He, he's young. You he said he's 23 years old. You know, I feel like, you know, normally he should be looking to us for advice. You know, we're the <laughs> old guys here. Well, you know, we're, we're going to be asking, you know, he, he's, I don't want to say a kid, but, you know, kind of a kid, you know. <laughs> but, but, uh, well, how long have you been fishing, Bailey? Like, uh, what, how'd you get started? You know, uh, and, you know, what led you to doing your podcast? Yeah. And real quick before I do that, I mean, and Ryan, that I kind of feel the same way when I talk to Jackson Orr. I mean, that kid's <laughs> five young, five years younger than me, I think. He's, he's, oh, a man, wizard, he, man. he's a prodigy. He, he is the prodigy. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. Uh, but Jackson's yeah, awesome I've, been, I've been fishing for, I don't remember the first fish I caught. Funny story. Um, my first fish I caught out of a local lake here. Uh, my dad has to tell me the story because I was too young to remember it. Uh, basically i just caught like some two pound bass nothing big or anything but to me i was tiny so to me i thought it was big and uh, apparently i started just started crying and told my dad to take the rod i couldn't handle it so <laughs> that was my first that was my first fish uh not a glorious story by any means i still but, have that reaction you know <laughs> yeah. uh but yeah i got i started there and obviously i my dad got me outdoors and uh grew up hunting and fishing um you know i was out in the woods before i could even get my license old enough you know my dad was the one that kind of instilled that passion in me um but then really kind of took off when i got 15 16 years old got my driver's license can kind of go out on my own wouldn't have to you know rely on my my dad to take me because he was always very busy with work and obviously didn't want to bug him because you never really want to piss off your dad so uh once i got my driver's license i was more of pissing him off to take his truck to go fishing uh so (laughs) It's kind of started there and then got into a kayak and uh, kind of the rest is history. Just kind of obviously just the addiction has grown every year, every season, every day. And uh, just kind of try to consume more aspects of my life with fishing as much as possible. And it's just kind of a nonstop learn as much as you can, soak it in, adapt. And I don't know. It's just it's literally my I know it's cliche, but like it literally is my entire life at this point. We certainly understand how that can happen, right, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, and, I'm sure uh, anybody listening to this can understand that. <laughs> and and I also wanted to say, like, as far as when you caught your first fish, you know, I was in my twenties when I caught my first bass, and I think I cried a little then too. So <laughs> don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel as bad then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it it only took me like a year and a half of bass fishing to finally catch a bass. So. <laughs> oh man it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's been a rough journey dying. but we're getting yeah. there we're getting but you're there. here that's right that's right yeah you persevered heck yeah i i will say that one of the best things i ever did as far as learning to fish was start doing a podcast because like I've, I've grown so much as a fisherman since we started started doing the podcast you know, I've learned a lot. I've I've definitely got better gear than I had back then. And Sean, <laughs> I, I I feel like you're in the same boat since you joined. You know, it's you've been what well, it's been about a year now, right at a year since you joined. Yeah, since I've been on the podcast, and yeah. I mean, you, you I, just I, can't. I, you can't talk to people like Jody Queen and Russ Snyder's and not come away a better fisherman. It's just not going to happen. So. Uh, yeah, we've been every, blessed to say the least. <laughs> every person you come in contact, no matter if it's your first time meeting them or your 10th or your hundred, you're going to learn something getting out in the water with them or talking with them. And you know, Ryan, like you said, like haven't been on a podcast that being on a podcast, especially as a host. And I can attest to that too. Like it rapidly accelerates your learning curve when it comes to, I mean, you can, you can apply it to everything. The more you talk about a subject and you talk about it with multiple people and various people, you're bound to accelerate how much you're learning and how much you're taking in, especially if you take the time to like soak it all in 
evaluate what they're saying and actually like go and put it, you know, to work yourself. So that's, I can, I mean, that's huge, huge. Yeah. Just putting in the effort yeah. to, to learn as much as you can. Heck yeah. Totally it agree. Really I yeah. agree too. Yeah. And, it, and it's not just like here on the, the new show, we like to talk about, you know, uh, technique specific stuff, uh, tricks and tips, you know, but, you know, just talking to those guys and about their mindset of how they approach a day on the water, how they deal with um, good days and bad days, you know, that's, that's really what's helped me. Um, Cause you know, everybody has their times where they struggle and, and, you know, you know, both Ryan and I have had our days where we're like, uh, I'm just going to get rid of all my fishing crap. Cause I just can't <laughs> do that. Something's not going right. But, you know, I think through talking to those guys and hearing them say, oh yeah, I, I struggled and, you know, how they deal with that has really helped me too. So I think yes. Yeah. Having a good guy. network is crucial. Oh my gosh. Yes. Whoop. We just lost Ryan. What happened, Ryan? Oh, he's working on his uh, having some technical difficulties, but he feels so, the shame coming from everyone from Tennessee. <laughs> so they're all they just don't want to hear him anymore, and he can feel it. <laughs> picking stuff out. <laughs> I'm, I'm having lighting issues. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to work on. This. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it seems like one of your specialties, you know, the light. My lighting's not going to be great, so You're good, hopefully man. most of y'all ain't watching this and y'all are listening. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it seems like one of your specialties is offshore smallmouth fishing, and up there in New York, it's like y'all have some giant mutated smallmouth. <laughs> it, I, I mean, it's like you know, maybe not right now since you're not able to get out uh, due to the ice, but man, it's around during the fishing season for y'all, man, it's like you're constantly pulling out these huge smallmouth and hearing you talk about it, like, like you going around, like on your podcast, you know, you talk about, you know, catching all these smallmouth. Like I'm, I'm so jealous. Cause like, I don't know if I've ever caught like an offshore fish ever. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I know we've dabbled in it, uh, with a few people before, but uh, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about that too. Like, where, where do you even? How do you even get started with that? Because uh, me and Sean have talked about it before. How, you know, if we try to approach like offshore fishing, you know, if we see something on our graph, which I've got like a little four inch Lorentz hook, uh, hook two four X. So like four inches it is no side scan or down scan mm -hmm. uh sean i believe he's got down scan and side scan but it, uh, you got like a five inch screen right right so so it's still kind of a small screen but he's got the side scan and down scan right but if we do see something mm -hmm. on we don't know like is it below us is that in front of us or is that something we already passed or what so mm -hmm. how, how do you even get started targeting offshore so I think the biggest thing uh, to get started, um, honestly, probably not even on the water, which is kind of might, might sound weird. Uh, and I think one thing to note too, this is just kind of what I look, how I look at it. So it's probably not the best way, but it's worked for me a little bit thus far. Um, is it's like a, if you guys use Navionics or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, you know if. For those listening, if you don't want to buy the application, uh, if you go to Navionics web app on your browser, you can get it for free. It just doesn't have any GPS. Um, I think that is the best way to get started. And it's looking at that from a, a familiar body of water and trying to just learn how to read that map. Um, so knowing what humps look like versus holes. Um, and then almost trying to, when you see that and you know where it is, try to almost develop this kind of like a, I, want to, I don't want to say 3D, but try to visualize it above the water. So that way you can kind of help help yourself understand how those fish are going to set up and how you should position yourself to therefore try to target those fish. Um, and that's how I kind of got started with it. Um, I had a really good buddy. Uh, his name's Alex Coral, absolute hammer. A, uh, a guy who's very underrated here and doesn't get talked about enough up here in New York, but um, kind of took me out uh, under his wing, helped me learn some what it's how to not only find fish offshore, but how to target them as well. Um, but getting out there and even if you have like a simple 
down imaging. Like, like you said, you have a, a hook, hook two or hook four, I think you mentioned. Um, I started out with a Garmin Striker 4, so I only had that simple sonar. Okay. And I was basically – and we talked about this. Um, we did a podcast with Mikey Balls, and we talked specifically about this, about graphing. Um, you can still find those fish, but you're just like you, – you when you don't have side imaging, you, you just kind of have to deal with the fact that you're going to have to work twice as hard, if not four times as harder, than somebody with side imaging is going to have to. So basically I was the dummy out there with my striker four with just sonar and I was holding in my right hand. I had my Navionics app and I'm just paddling or pedaling around, just trying to find something like looking back and forth, trying to figure out what was going on uh, and, and just kind of dropping simple waypoints. And then usually when you get start getting those first couple bites and you start trying to present that bait is when things start to click. Um, and then obviously making the upgrade to a, a bigger graph that has side imaging Getting a better mapping chip, getting a mapping chip inside of your graph is huge because it makes it so much more efficient. Uh, that just makes things so much easier. And you can kind of, the more you see those fish, the more you adjust your settings, you can kind of learn to like even read the fish on the graph to see how they're positioning, what kind of mood or behavior they're in. Like if you find a fish, if you're in 15 foot of water, and it, feel free to stop me and tell me to shut up at any point because I'll rant and I'll rant probably forever. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. The more you talk, the less we had to. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so like say you're in 20 foot of water talking about how you can read fish behavior. If you know that there's fish on a say, say you're on a hump, hump comes up to 20 foot. Those fish are maybe on the bottom, if not two, three foot off the bottom. Those are going to be easy targeted fish. They're going to be active fish. If a fish is, say 10 foot suspended, that fish is going to be difficult and it's probably not in an aggressive mood. Now that could be, it also could be different depending on if those are schoolers or not. If it's more than one that's suspended, those might be schoolers, but it's, it, you kind of learn for with experience and just trying different things and getting out there over and over and over again. Uh, you kind of learn different situ uh, situations, scenarios, and kind of can piece it together, you know, when something comes up and it kind of just becomes quicker how you can read them. But then obviously there's always something new, but dude, this is the thing for off offshore fishing to me is I would get out there and, you know, the banks would be so much fun during spawn when you'd see all these boats up there on the, on the, uh, on the shore. And I was like, when I'd gotten my kayak and everything, that's when I started really looking into it. It's like, why aren't guys out on 90% of the lake that's not being fished. Like there's gotta be fish out there looked into it more and obviously realized, okay, this is a thing and made a network, got some connections and like started learning. And like, it's, it's crazy. There's a shift. And I think it's being talked about down South as well as how everyone is, is offshore now. So shallows becoming good down South but up <laughs> here in the North in the North, we're still like five years behind. So everyone's still up shallow and offshore fish are like, they don't see baits as much if at all. So it's like when they're out there, it's much easier to catch them. And I'm already working hard to find them. I don't want to work just as hard to catch them. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's just so much fun offshore. I, I like the electronic aspect of it. Uh, I'm sure I didn't even answer the question you asked, but there, there's, you know, 10 minutes of talking offshore. <laughs> <laughs> well, well let, let me ask you this because you, you were mentioning humps and you might have already kind of answered this and i just not didn't understand it because i got kind of a simple brain but uh <laughs> you know you, you hear people talk about humps they're like oh yeah fish the humps i've never heard anybody that i can remember actually explain how to fish a hump because i've attempted to, uh because there's one specific hump down here on one of the local lakes where there's it's a Actually, you know, it comes up pretty close to the surface of the uh, the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's actually like a piece of white PVC or something sticking out, but put there by T TWRA to let boaters know that it's there. Right. Uh, so it, that one's pretty easy to see where it's at. So that's where I practice at. But I don't are, are to be on on top of that hump or like on the sides of the hump like how where do you cast do you cast over it and bring your lure over top of it or do you go to the side and bring it like how do you target the hump where are the fish at on it? yeah i think that could be you know the answer could be different 
depending if there's current or not, that could be a huge factor. And depending on how you situate on that, how big the hump is, like, okay. is there, is there a 40 yard flat on top of it where you can't cast across it? I mean, if it's something where you could simply sit on the South end of it and cast past it on the North end, you, I mean, if it, in that kind of terms, you want to sit off of the hump, you don't, you never really want to be on top of it. Cause that's where the fish are going to be. They're going to be either on top or they're going to be situated just off the break. And that's what they're sitting there waiting for bait fish, uh, whether bait fish or crawdads, if there's rock. I mean, if it's, if you're talking about just hard bottom, you're probably just going to want to, you want take a few casts, try to bomb it across, across that hump, bring it over the hump. And then if you know there's fish there, try hitting the break. So like, say if you're on the South side of that hump, try hitting the East or the West side. So like, so say your hump's here, right? You're going to position below it and you're going to cast to, the east and the west side where those breaks are and try to target and maybe maybe that might be an avenue where those uh the prey might be trying to get around the hump and those fish might be sitting on that south side and like you can obviously that's like an ambush point but if there's no current i mean i would just play around with your angle i would just start somewhere sitting off of it cast if you know there's fish there go to the complete opposite side change your angle of approach um but if there's current i mean that could be it's it's super interesting and like up here we have like the st lawrence river we have our big glacial lakes that can have wind driven current um and that really plays it It cannot it's almost easier to position yourself because like the current kind of forces you to but like you basically like say if there's like a hump out on st lawrence river you basically want to get down current of that and cast up to it or you want to do a drift drifts can be that's a whole that's a whole nother episode Drifts are crazy. <laughs> uh, but what's interesting is you'll have fish that are like more lazy fish sitting behind that current where there's a break, but there's also fish that might be a little more aggressive that are going to sit on that front facing part of that hump. So what the current is doing, so there's the hump, that current is coming and hitting that. But the fact that it's hitting that hump, it's creating almost like a, like a bubble right below it. So there's fish that can sit in that bubble and wait. And they, there's, there's no current hitting them. It's just flowing right over them. And that bait's just coming right to them, being driven by the current. So it's like one of those things you kind of kind of play around with it. And electronics are huge. Like you got to go, like you just take a couple laps over it. And under the kayak, it's kind of nice because you don't have a loud freaking motor. So those fish don't know you're there for the most part. And you can kind of tell if there's fish there or not. And if not, you can, when you get good with it, you can kind of just move on and know that there's not fish sitting up right there. You can kind of tell if there's maybe two or three, they might be moving somewhere else they might be on the way or depending on the season they might be moving away from you so it's it's one of those things where it's kind of a seasonal thing and kind of just kind of get a read for what the fish are doing but yeah that's probably might be a loaded answer but <laughs> so it, so as we, you're go ahead ryan i was gonna say you got my brain flowing about this particular hump because i feel like i can figure if i can figure that out that'll help me you know well, like target other humps right but, uh but it's, it's yeah. up to you if you, want, if you want to like give more specifics on it but like does it have current uh yeah it's actually like right off the main channel mm -hmm. uh so so i'm sure there's current hitting it over there so i try yeah, to position I'm, yourself what i'm trying to picture try to position yourself on the down current side of it so like I, where I the current's going this up, down I can, yeah, if it does it create like an eddy off the side of it, if it's off a main river channel. Let me because if it creates an eddy, that's perfect for you in the kayak because you don't have to move. <laughs> just sit in that eddy and then you just cast over top of it and let your bait just free flow down. Depending on what you're throwing. So, uh hang on, let me pull this uh sean you were gonna say something a minute ago I'm not sure. i was just gonna ask uh um bailey as you're moving around how much are you looking at your graph to determine whether you're gonna stop or fit and fish or are you constantly looking for groups of fish to at least make it worthwhile or or if you see one or two will you stop and throw i think it really depends on the buy if i'm going for smallmouth, if i see one or two I mean, chances are there's probably more. If you see like four or five, chances are there's probably 20. Okay. Um, largemouth are kind of tricky when they're offshore. Um, 
but for the most part, I mean, if I'm not seeing at least two or three fish on my graph, I'm not going to stop. Can, um, can you... It's pretty blurry. It, hang on. I, can, I think, is zoom, is it, can you zoom into it? Because I think I see a hump with like a green pin. Well, there's a, uh, there's like a, let me move my, it's like a red circle. Probably oh, okay. easy for me to just screen and send it to you. Yeah, how much how much does that rise from so it, it looks it's, like it's on a decline? Not, yeah, it's it's not huge. It's you know, this is showing it's showing that it's five feet here at the hump and you know it kind of tapers off to like nine foot right in there. Hmm. It actually it actually looks like it's less of a drop is than it normally does. I don't know why, but <laughs> yeah, you can just screenshot and send it to me if you want. It. We can just talk about it after. Yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll send it to uh, Sean as well, so he's not lost. Cool. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um. So yeah, basically, when I'm looking for schools, so like on a certain body of water, where I know I'm going to be looking for a spot where it's going to be offshore. And I want to sit on that spot for a while and catch several fish. Uh, I'm going to look for at least two to three marks because chances are there's probably going to be 10 to 12 fish. Um, just because usually when you graph those fish, especially on unless you're seeing a big school on your side imaging, if you're looking on kind of on your down imaging, if you see two or three, chances are there's three to four times what's actually there. Um, just because that's what's inside of your cone, uh, the whole cone be kind of confusing and it's kind of different i think with different transducers from different companies but like general rule of thumb is i think is like every 10 foot is like three feet or every three foot is i don't know the actual numbers for it but it's supposed to be I think like 30 foot uh if you're on 30 foot of water your cone is i want to say like i want to say your cone's like 60 foot circumference if that makes any sense. Yeah, we've talked to Bass Geek about this before, about how the, I think it's a rule of thirds. Depend, well, it depends on, A, what, uh, you know, whether you're running, uh, you know, high res or, or what is it, 433 or 800 megahertz. Yeah, right. You know, but, uh, but yeah, I, mean, I remember him saying something about that as well. Yeah. It's... But that, that makes sense that if you're, you know, what you're seeing on your cone is obviously only a fraction of what's actually mm -hmm. down there. So it makes sense if you see a bunch on your cone that there's probably more surrounding that cone. So, yeah. Yeah. And like for, for me, kind of like what I like to do is for the, most of the time I'm going to have, uh, I run an HDS nine. And what I do is I have my bottom layer as side imaging, both sides. And I usually have it out 60 to 80. And then I have is, I have my mapping in my top left, and then I have uh, I have my 2D, and I have a down imaging cut in half on my top right. And basically, predominantly, what I'm doing is I'm looking at that mapping from where I want to position myself to graph, and then I'm looking at my side imaging because I'm looking for structure, but I'm also kind of glancing at my sonar to kind of get a feel for what's going on. Um, so, like, if I find an area, so say I'm on, I'm side imaging. And you usually say if you're on 30, 40 foot of water, you're not going to see those fish on side imaging. They're going to be absolutely minuscule. Like 12 to 15 is perfect to find fish on side imaging. They'll glow pretty well. Um, I think that's a lot of a, a big misconception, uh, misconception people do is like say you're in 30 foot of water and you see a big mark off the side in side imaging. You're like, oh, it's a big fish. And like, yeah, it's probably a carp. Like it's, it has to be a big fish to make that, to glow that much. Um but basically I try to find structure with the side imaging and it, depending on what depth it is, I go back over that depth and I look at my 2d, my down imaging to see if there's fish on it. Um, you can kind of adjust from there if you want to actually stop and fish, but like either way you mark it and just keep it there. Cause you never know certain conditions can pop up and you were like, Oh, I have that one place marked. There could be with this conditions, those fish could be right there. I definitely gotta get gotta get better at dropping waypoints because too often I I I gra or pass over them graphing see them and I'll just instantly want to turn the kayak and just start throwing. But if I drop a 
a pin, it'll help me find them better than just trying to eyeball. Uh, oh yeah. Once I turn around and I, but usually I get so excited. I'm like, Oh, whoa, look at that. And I get more concentrated on not losing the spot than I do, you know, and I should just, you know, drop a pin and then, you know, make my turn and be able to look at that pin and say, that's where they are. And okay, this is where I am in regards, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, I, I just lost my train of thought in, we got in, in, in aspect to that <laughs> to that mark, you know. So I, you know, rather because so many times I I just try and turn around and and try and cast to that spot, and more often times than not, it in the process of turning I lose where it is, or you know. So mm -hmm. I I think that's a definitely something I need to get better at is actually dropping the waypoint on the graph so that I have a frame of reference to to, oh, yeah. know, to know positioning wise. So heck yeah, dude! I mean, if there, if you know the structure there, it's especially if like it's a non-tournament it's so important like it could be that's a fisherman's like standby is his waypoints like that's his his lifeline so i mean you if you know the structure there like you know it's not an area where it's just a random rogue fish i mean drop a waypoint on it because if that fish if you see fish there chances are good most likely they're still going to be there when you turn around and if they're not there when you turn around you weren't going to catch them anyways because they were already gone out of your cone by the time you dropped down. Now that obviously could be different. Like if you're dropping on smallmouth, you want to drop right away because you want to get to them ASAP, especially if it's like summer months. But uh, for the most part, if you know the structure there, yeah, get your waypoints there. Because like you might miss a fish now, but like now you have a waypoint for fish for however long you want to fish it. Right, right. That makes sense for sure. Yeah. I've always wondered, you know, because I haven't played too much with um... – waypoints which mm -hmm. i mean i've got a cheaper unit so it might be different with like the more expensive units but i've always wondered like after i unplug my battery and everything if it still saves inside there or if it resets it. your your units have a, a memory like if you go back on my garmin striker 4 i didn't have mapping whatsoever but it like will tell me where my boat is so if, like you just look at my garmin striker and you go on the GPS and it's just random plotted dots on the screen. You just take relative of your boat where it is to the waypoint. Uh, but it is a lot easier yeah. with, with bigger graphs that you can actually put mapping chips into. It's so much easier because, you know, especially, it's you know, good. if you're on the off the water afterwards and you want to do a little, you know, analysis of your day, you can sit there and use your graph with the mapping when you're off the water. You don't have to be. Uh, like on the water in your boat and that sort of thing. You just got to hook it up to the battery, obviously. But yeah, see, that, that's, that's what I've got. Mine is like a white screen, and it allows mm -hmm. me to make a waypoint. But I've never – I've been meaning to. I just – when I get on the water, I'm like, I want to fish, I want to fish, I want to fish. So I've, I've <laughs> never stopped to do it, but I wanted to play with it and, like, mark it, unplug my battery, reset it, see if it saves. But like I said, I'm, it'll still I be there. Done it. Yeah. Cool. I mean, if you have 2,000, it'll probably over capacity. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, now I'm drawing a blank. Was that? <laughs> uh, it's contagious, Sean. It's contagious. My bad. My bad. <laughs> I was, um, I was going to ask you, uh, when you are, when you were revisiting your points, I guess you you really concentrate on positioning. I've heard you know positioning is everything. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know if you if you're you can be at the right spot on the right fish throwing the right lure, but if you're throwing it from the wrong angle, you know sometimes oh, yeah. they're they're not going to care. So um, I'm sure that really helps with uh, your waypoints as well as as knowing your boat position in in regards to those waypoints, so you know a how to approach it where to cast i know um i think i was the bass geek that was talking about dropping the markers to somebody we we interviewed was talking about yeah. actually having yeah. like a, a weighted marker so he would you know drop yeah, that. like a buoy yeah and uh, i've thought about doing that too but again it's something i never have done but you know another tip that i've heard and thought yeah that was an awesome idea but then never did it i was kind of afraid about tangling with that when i cast but uh uh, I think he's a little far behind in the times. <laughs> I mean, those were those are crucial. I mean, I can still see why there's a place for him, especially you know if you don't have good mapping on your graph. 
So like say Ryan in your case, right? Where you, you know, you pretty much only have solely 2d, uh, that could be beneficial. Say you find a hump, you mark a waypoint, And I know how obnoxious a, a map, you know, quote unquote mapping can be with, you know, just a, like a striker four or a, a hook two. I want to say they're kind of similar because you said it's just a white screen. That's what basically I had. So all you have is like dot and your boat. So it's kind of be kind of difficult to see where am I in comparison to that? So that's where I could see it could be beneficial. Um, but like for me, like with the Lawrence I use on my mapping, it, it shows rings and you can set it different rings, different measurements. So like I have rings going out to 20 foot, 40 foot, 60 foot. And I kind of go off of that. So like for me, I get a half, like an, an easy cast is about 40 to 60 foot. And with that, you can kind of base yourself where that spot's going to be in comparison and try to position yourself. But it's always good to kind of work your way up to a waypoint. That's probably the best way to do it is start to where you know it's too far away and kind of work your way up. Um, but like going back to what you mentioned of like positioning, I mean, if you're on a lake that doesn't have any current, unless maybe obviously wind driven is completely different, but like take like up here by me, a glacial lake that really doesn't have much current whatsoever. It, your boat positioning isn't huge. It can be depending on the season. Like I've actually found in cases where I have, I found a offshore rock pile that's off of. Um, that's like a pre-spawn area for them to stage before they go up into a spawning flat before the spawn. And I have noticed that if you stay off of that and you cast on the flat and pull towards them towards their wintering holes, they won't eat at as good as you pulling towards the spawning flat, if that makes any sense. It's kind of, it's kind of weird, but then you'll have it like vice versa. But yeah, that doesn't really matter as much as like current does. So like if you're on say the St. Lawrence river, and the current's flowing towards you and say you're you're casting let me get my mind right here so like if you're going with the current you're casting like so then you're casting against the current that's no bueno because what's going to happen is that current says it's flowing this way these fish are going to be sitting and looking up towards the, against the current because that's how the bait is going to come to them they're not going to look all you're going to do is blow by those fish if you cast with the current, if that makes sense, or against the current. Yeah. Because you'd be right. taking that behind them. So, like, if you cast with the current, you're bringing it to their face. If you cast against the current, you're taking it up their butt. So, it's like, you're not going to be able to catch them unless you, you know, they spin around on it and chase it, and chances are they're not really going to want to do that as much as they're going to want to see it with their face and then eat it. Right, so. right. You want to come into the business end of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and one of the things I remember when, as we were, as my brain was scrambling there, um, one of my main regrets with picking up the, the, I have an elite five TI uh, mm -hmm. and the five inch screen is uh, what it was, what I could afford at the time. And right. I, I do have the triple scan. So I have side imaging and down imaging. Um, but on side scan, it's such a small screen that seeing, making sense of what I'm seeing is, super tough anyway mm -hmm. so to be honest i really don't use my side imaging that much just because um i can see large structure like uh lay downs and stuff like that but as far as identifying fish it's nearly impossible on that screen so it's tough yeah i mean i've had a couple of buddies that asked me you know i'm thinking about getting a seven but is the nine worth it because i went with a nine and i tell them you know if i could i if i had the money for it i would have gotten a 12 because I mean, the difference between a seven and a nine is seeing a boulder and not seeing a boulder. That's right. Just, that's just the reality, and it sucks. But, like, obviously stay within your means. Like, there's nothing wrong with not having good enough technology. You can still catch those fish. It's just the reality of it is you're going to have to work harder. Right, right. Um, obviously, I've, I've caught fish. And, and when I upgrade, which, uh, you know, who knows when that will be, but I will definitely – you know, at least probably double my screen size or, you know, jump up to a nine from a five. Cause I imagine the difference is going to be huge, but, um, and again, you know, everybody starts somewhere. So, you know, if, if all you can afford is, you know, a little, you know, 2d down, down imaging or uh, a sonar straight sonar, that's what you get. Um, you know, heck who, uh, who was Brian just talking to where he's like, I'm not even using a fish finder this year. Uh, and uh, he's yeah, the Aaron Stagger, yeah, and he's winning tournaments, sick. yeah. So, obviously, you don't need it, but obviously, 
some people rely on it and it, it definitely is an aid to some people like we were mm -hmm. talking before the show about the pan optics and how you know it's it's video game fishing man what you see is what you get and you can uh -huh. actually watch them just move up and hit your bait so i mm -hmm. that sounds amazing to me but um you know again you know it, it, it you, you do with what you can and you know if it, if it can offer you an advantage like i can see if i was a tournament angler i would totally um, be investing in that because I think that can make it can be a game changer. But for you know me who gets out you know when I can you know and in, in fishing when it's warm out you know I get out two to three times a week. You know mm -hmm. is panoptics going to be worthwhile for me? Maybe not. But you know would it yeah. would I love it? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, I would <laughs> I would geek out totally to have it. But um, yeah. it just might not be in the cards for me. And, you know, so you learn to use what you can and upgrade where you can. And, you know, you know, I think that's yeah. I, that, uh, that third stimulus check, you know, <laughs> work, so. <laughs> but see, the problem is I've, I've, I've been like, oh, I could get a kayak. I could get a sonar I could, or a, a new fish finder. Or there's and the wife's like, I could get a new piece of jewelry. Exactly. And my wife's like, no, nope, no, no. Nope. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, too. And I think it, it should be known, like, and I think that's not stressed enough, is, like, you don't need to have these graphs. You don't need to have them. To me, in my mind, I have to have them because I love offshore fishing, and that's one of my biggest strengths. But do I need it? Heck no. No, I don't need it. I mean, look at John Cox on the Bassmaster Elite Series. Or look at like 90% of what kayak anglers are doing now is they're getting these backwaters without graphs and they're cracking giants winning derbs. I mean, that's – Drew Gregory. Drew Gregory's a huge one. Yeah. It takes three rods with him. I mean, I can't imagine doing that. My mind goes crazy because if I have something wrong, like one thing I'm missing, I'm like, I should have brought that rod. And then I bring 12 rods with me and then it's a cluster. <laughs> I'm yeah. super jealous of those guys, but like you, you don't need them. Cause like, and people say like, Oh, this tournament's going to be one offshore. And those people, while yes, there's a very good chance it could be one offshore. There's always going to be some fish up dirt shallow and they're going to be able to be caught because they're up dirt shallow and they're dirt shallow for one reason. And that's to feed. So that's, you don't need them. Like for anyone listening and thinking that I was going through the process or stressing out because they don't have a good enough graph. It's not true. Just get up shallow, cover water. It's shallow fishing is a lot of fun. It definitely helps though when yeah. you know when you're you like Ryan and I, you know, where you're shallow fishing and you're they're not there that day to to have a stand or a, a a plan B. You know of oh you know what I can just go out deep and and see what I can find out there. So um, mm -hmm. that's where I want to get. I'm not there yet. Um, I still as soon as I lose the the comfort of catching them in the shallows uh and know i have to go deep to mm -hmm. get them uh, uh that's when i'm like okay let's go shoot in the dark here and see what we can find and haven't been as lucky or as productive as i would like to yet but you know definitely i'm learning and and uh you know i'm also you know right now in the winter uh on the lake that i fish most I, they say that's where you go so i haven't been beating the bank I've tried it and, you know, didn't have a whole lot of luck, mm -hmm. but then I've also haven't had a luck, a lot of luck fishing deep, but I attribute yeah. that more to inexperience um, than I do not being, not having fish where I'm looking. So mm -hmm. a day on the water where you don't catch anything is just as valuable as a day on the water. Where you catch a hundred. Right. It right. could be more valuable than a day on the water. Yeah, where you, come, you, you know, I, I hear people say that and like, that's coming from people that rarely ever have, days where you don't catch anything you know for us that have a lot of those days not catching anything it gets really frustrating i i can understand that and every angler's been in that stage though dude like you get to an angler that goes out there and smashes them all the time and that's just because he's had a hundred days where he catches jack crap and he just but those are the anglers that are after their day in the water they don't catch anything even if they do catch stuff they're asking themselves the right questions. Like, what did I do well today? What did I do wrong? Why did, why was it wrong? What should I have done differently? What variables did I look past? Did I not dive deep into enough? You know, like, was it one of those things where you knew you went up shallow, but you didn't go shallow enough? Or did you pass on that one Creek where you might've had a gut feeling that they might be in there, but you're like, Oh, it's just a weird time of year for them to be up there. But then you go and see a tournament gets one out of there. So it's like one of those things that's, you got to ask yourself questions every day. That's what I try to do. Like every drive home, 
I try to like ask myself simple questions. What did I do good? What did I do bad? What could I have done differently? Even if I went out and had a great day, there's something I probably could have done where I could have caught more fish, caught bigger fish, done something more efficiently. Cause there's always something like if you try to take one lesson out of every time you're out on the water, one lesson, like it's crazy how much you learn and you can remember. Cause next time you're out in the water, you're like, wait, this is where I went wrong last time. And then you switch. And then when you switch and you catch one light bulb clicks and then things just start kind of spiral and you're just starting to get dialed. So it's just kind of one of those, one of those things you got to roll with the hits. And then once it happens, it's not going to happen as often. And, and that's probably one of my biggest issues and something that I have tried to work on is paying attention to those little details. Like whenever you catch a fish, try like just trying to look at all the details went into catching that fish. Cause you, you hear some people, you know, better anglers talk about like, which way was the wind blowing, which way was the sun hitting and all this stuff. And when I catch a fish, I'm just like, Oh yeah, I caught a fish. And I don't, tend to take in all those details <laughs> yeah, i'm just excited i caught a fish you know yeah. and uh, i've been trying to get better at that kind of stuff and and reflecting back on it afterwards mm -hmm. trying to bring in that but uh yeah still not great at that yeah i mean some quick variables too that i've been i try to remind myself too is like when you're trying to get a feel for what those fish are doing like if you do run into a fish and you don't understand why it's there like First of all, depending on time of year, see if it's peeing. Like then you can kind of tell if it's a male or, or female. But also tell uh, if you squish its belly, if it's soft and it's like a bit like have like it's obviously they've been feeding. If it's soft, that's bait fish that they're eating. If it's harder, they're eating crawdads. So it's kind of one of those things. Then you can kind of get a feel for how they're behaving and you can kind of make adjustments from there depending on like so like if you catch, you know, two two or three dinks on a, ra a red rattle trap and they have that hard belly so obviously they're eating crawdads but you switch to a football jig instead and now you're catching females i mean click they're just eating cross i don't think i ever thought or heard about that before that's something of squeezing their bellies that's i'm gonna that's gonna be something i'm gonna try now for one sure one of the first things i do in practice if i catch one interesting especially on a new body of water that's that can be pretty crucial i think that's a good tip New body of water, too, something that I was taught uh, by one of my buddies is to go up really shallow, shallow, especially if it's clear water. And if it's clear, it's a lot easier. But like, even if it's dirty, try to, like, collect some stuff from the bottom and kind of evaluate. Like, look for look for claws from crawdads. Look for, you know, maybe dead bait fish or something. Trying to get a feel for what's going on. Because, like, any little variable is going to help you. So it's just one of those things of trying to experiment. Not saying go try to be one with the water, dive in, go scuba diving, but like <laughs> something, something little to pay attention to that you can do for two minutes while you're at the ramp. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've I've had a, a similar thing where I've actually you know noticed something like that and been able to put it to use. You know, uh, I was out on uh, on Stones River, I believe it was last year, or well, well I guess not last 2019 fall and uh actually get, went over to the bank got out to uh to pee came back and you know i'm on i'm standing on this like rock and then it like drops off like this rock wall and i, I look down and i see like a like a brown crawdad you know in the water running on this rock that i'm standing on tied on a natural crawl jig and you know started catching them my buddy there you Heck yeah. It's just little variables, man. The more you learn, the more you adjust to them. Like you're never, and that's the fun thing about fishing is you're never going to understand everything, but like little things are going to get easier and it's going to come more naturally. And you're going to have these anglers that are, you know, looking at a tournament side of things. I mean, a great example for like kayak side, Cody Milton or Russ Snyder's, there's a reason why they are so good every single time. You no, know, it's because these variables, they're just coming more naturally. It's muscle memory and just coming quicker. They're putting things together faster. It's not like they're doing anything crazy. They're just understanding the fish better. Right, right. Uh, and once I'm, your confidence builds, I think, you know, confidence builds confidence. So the... Oh, confidence the, is huge. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. is 90% mental. Oh, yeah. It's definitely... Yeah. and and it's a struggle for, for, uh, you know, noobs because, you know, they don't have that confidence and 
you know, unfortunately, you know, that the, the same is also true that if, you know, you're really struggling, you know, it's hard to build confidence, but that's where you just have to, you have to put in the time, you know, to spend time on the water. You know, that, that was what, uh, one of the things that was tough for me to learn. I could watch a million YouTube videos, mm -hmm. but until I actually went out on the water and, and practiced what I was learning. And, and like you said, you know, even if you don't catch anything, um, learn from what you did. So, uh, maybe, Hey, I spent too much time throwing this or in this location where I wasn't having any bites. So, um, you know, just learn from that and, and, and move forward. So I, I think that's huge. De definitely putting the time in, um, you know, and it's tough because, you know, as weekend warriors or, you know, sometimes we don't have as much time as some of these guys do where they spend, you know, you know, hours every day on the water. But, uh, you know, definitely the, the more time you can spend, I think the more it's going to help you grow. Oh yeah. And I think another thing that's crucial too, you know, like say, I mean, obviously YouTube videos, you can learn a lot from, but I think another thing that's important is feed through the bull. There's a lot of BS out there that people put out. Uh, and it's just kind of one of those things where, you can learn from them, but like, don't make it like when you, when they say something, don't think of it as like, that is the rule. Like it's night and day. Just try to like to see what, remember what they say. And then when you go out in the water, kind of apply it, see if it does apply for by you. Cause a lot of it could be regional advice. Right. See what kind of applies by you. What works for you. Don't like take that thing to heart completely and be like, all right, what they say is 100% correct. And it's impossible if it's any other way, like, cause that's not true at all. Uh, I think another thing that's important too is like, like we talked about that network and network is huge. Like if you're struggling to do something, if you're having a couple bad days, you know, reach out to a buddy or maybe even reach out to a guy that you've never talked to before. And I mean, don't go ask and be like, Hey, can you go put me on some fish? Put me in you know, kind of your spots, I'm never ask for spots, but like, be like, Hey man, I'm struggling. I want to learn. Cause a lot of guys, especially true anglers, they're going to respect the grind. They respect you wanting to learn. They're like, Hey man, is there any, any chance that we can link up and we can just either chat or maybe get on the water, you know, just help me put these things together. I'm like, and, you know, try to reinforce that, you know, I'm not asking for your spots, but like, can you help me learn these fish a little bit better? Right. And, and people, people respect this. I mean, you, you might get shot down, but also my people will probably respect it and probably meet up with you. So I, I think, you know, our community, the community of kayakers, uh, from what I've seen, you know, really is like that, The you know, I don't know how many people have offered, you know, to take me with them or, you know, uh, and I was very bashful at first and I, I still am that way to, to some, some respect, but, uh, you know, go out and check out your local kayak club and you'll be surprised how many people there want to, you know, want the sport to grow and we'll, we'll take you under their wing and kind of show you around at least enough, you know, yeah, you don't want to say, Hey, I want to, you know, put me on the fish or whatever you mm -hmm. respect their spots, but you know, there's so many people out there that are willing to, you know, help you and, and you just have to kind of take that step to reach out and ask for help. And that also yeah. what you were saying about YouTube, that was another thing that uh, took me a little bit to learn that, Oh, you know, I might see these guys catching huge bass, but that's out on the California Delta. That might not apply at all to me in Central PA. Um, there are obviously some things that are going to match up, but big giant uh, Huddleston swim baits might not be, even though they're slaying them out there with them. That's probably, you know, not going to totally be uh, something I'm going to, you know, slay them on the same way here in Central PA. Yeah, I, I, there's there's time and places for everything. And I think it also can go for like, if you're a kayak angler and you want to say, you know, you want to learn and you want to travel different lakes, trying to listen to the advice of somebody who only fishes golf course ponds is not going to help you at all. Not, you know, discrediting what they do. They have their own grind. They have their own niche in the fishing industry and all the power to them. But like, it's probably not going to translate and help you much when you want to go fish, you know, the TVA river system and they're fishing, you know, Jeff's golf golf course pond for these fish that never see baits. Right. Right. So it's just one of those things where you kind of got to evaluate. And th there's a lot of really good channels out there that you can learn a lot from that try to cover all the bases like tactical bassin or uh, Benjamin Nowak is a good one. I think he just changed his name back from smallmouth experience to Benjamin Nowak. Alex Rudd's a really good one. Cause he does some kayak stuff too. Mikey balls is a really, really good one. Some like advanced information. 
Um, there's, there's a lot of really good ones, a lot of good podcasts. Like obviously for the best kayak information, you guys are the, the show to come to, um, like Bass Talk Live is a good one. I mean, I could go on and on. I, it's actually really bad. My podcast, um, the, uh, the Apple podcast, my gallery of, Oh yeah. I'm the same. Uh, way. <laughs> it does not end. Like I'm just scrolling. I feel and bad. I, I neglect so many that I'm like, Oh, I should and it's half the time it's the paddle and fin ones that I neglect the most. So <laughs> sadly, but I highly recommend um do you guys listen to Let's Talk Fish with Brian Thrift and Matt Airy? Yeah. I highly recommend that one. And I highly recommend um if you have it within your budget, get a Bass University membership. I thought I've been about, that. about that. <laughs> I've had one for a while and you can learn a lot because that's when anglers are getting paid to come on there and do these seminars. So they're not giving you BS. They're spilling the beans. So like that's where you can really learn something. Hey, not hey, you're not taking the credit. It could be regional, but still like you're still going to learn. Yeah. You, you might be taking our listeners away from us here, you know, sending them to Bass <laughs> university, you know, calm down. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I Take know. I've, Take a mix of both because Sean and Ryan do an amazing job. So don't don't leave the show. <laughs> I've been on the Bass University mailing list forever. Like I get those emails all the time. Like, hey, subscribe, and I'm like, ah. Uh, so. I, 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 I just get a ton of ads that pop up on like Instagram and Facebook, and it's always tempting. They'll they'll, they'll give you like a. They do have free shows too. Yeah. Yeah, they give you like I, I think it's like a 30, 45, 60 minute or sixty second clip. Yep, uh, and mm, show you that yeah. like, oh yeah, this is good, and then it'll cut off, and it's like, oh man, <laughs> right at the end, yeah. really, won't spend that money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you know, you like to ask a question at the end of your podcast. Oh no! And so it made me think. Of, <laughs> oh, no. I, I I came up with a similar question. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, to, to ask you. Yeah, yeah. I'm I was not prepared for that question. question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's going to be similar, but I, I'm just going to ask for one person. You know, somebody not a not a relative. You know, somebody, uh, celebrity, some type of public figure, historical figure. You know, some somebody known. If you had to pick one person, I guess you can call it a celebrity. Uh, okay. Uh, like fish with a celebrity tournament. Uh, it, it could be any person, you know, cel current celebrity or in the past, a, a historical figure, anything mm -hmm. like that. If you could pick one person to be your fishing partner in a tournament, who would it be? Oh, and you took a spin on me there to the tournament. Cause I want to win. So they can't be a scrub. <laughs> I, I got to get somebody that can actually fish. <laughs> oh man. I had like a bunch of people I was going to say, like, I thought you were going to mix it how I do with the sit down, have a beer and a steak. But fish no, we're tournament. tournament fishing today. We're tournament fishing. <laughs> is there a, is there a big payout? Small yeah, would, payout? It, would, would, it be would it be different uh, if it wasn't? If it was, if it was small <laughs> payout, the answer would be a lot different. <laughs> um, oh, what's a good I'm payout? I'm not that competitive. I, I I'd be afraid the person would get mad at me for not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't. I don't it, it, it's. I'll do both. How about that? I'll give you one for both because I have one for both. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So I think big payout, like taking it serious. I'm going. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who he is. I don't even know what team he's on now. But uh, his name is DeAnthony Thomas. He's uh, he was a punt returner for the Chiefs. But he's a big bass head and he's a hunter. He's an outdoorsman. Uh, okay. He's also a former Oregon Duck. Uh, running back, so I was, I'm a big Oregon Duck football fan. Um, probably him, dude, because he posts bass past pictures on his page all the time. Um, I think I might have seen that right. actually. Now that you say that, yeah, D'Anthony Thomas, he's like ridiculously fast too. He ran like 27 miles an hour one time. I don't know. Besides the point, <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna help with fishing. But no, okay. no, no. <laughs> hey, he'll run from the back to the front. <laughs> hey, <what? laughs> yeah, hey, if you need, if you need Nobody's the net, I guess I can do that for you. Yeah, uh, but dude, I think for like a, a lower payout, like somebody to go like have fun with a tournament, like a Tuesday nighter or something like that, 
Uh, I'd probably pick Marcus Luttrell. He's not like a celebrity of celebrity, but he's like, I don't know if you guys have seen The Lone Survivor. Like, he's the guy they modeled that movie after, the one that's still alive. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Marcus Luttrell is the reason why I started my own business. Uh, Cause he went and in a speech he had, I think it was to Alabama football. It might've been, it was, it was that Clemson. I can't remember the video, but there's a YouTube video out there. I highly recommend going to look at it. Um, he has a speech where he's like, you know, after he went through all the crap that he went through, he was like, why would I waste another second of my life doing anything that I don't enjoy? So I kind of took that in perspective. It's like, why am I going to go apply for a job that I'm going to sit there and hate my life for five days a week? So I'm just going to, I'm going to take my chances and bet on me. I'm going to put in the work and now I enjoy what I do. I'm, I'm not where I want to be yet, but like, I'm still enjoying the road there. So I think his speech was pretty powerful in that. So I'd probably love to pick his brain and he's a, he's a good old boy from the South too. So I'd get along with him, I would think. And we'd have a lot of like a lot of stuff to talk about. I just pick his mindset. Cause it, I mean, he seems like a funny dude too. He cracks some jokes about falling through cliffs of Afghanistan. I don't know how you have that kind of humor after the crap he went through, but uh, yeah, you just, just kind of got to, right? Like, yeah, yeah, if you don't no choice to. It's but, laugh about yeah. it, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it'd be a big one. If you go Google uh, Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell speaking to Alabama football team, you can see it. So I'll, I yeah. definitely will check highly that recommend. Out. Highly recommend. Yeah. Well, Sean, do you want to give an answer to that question? Who would I fish with in a tournament? Oh, man. It can be a celebrity or some type of public figure or historical figure. I think, and and only because we've talked to him on several occasions, I want to fish with Jody Queen. I think he's such a down-to-earth guy. I feel like he wouldn't rag on me if I'm doing terrible, but he'd also help me. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, that's who I'm going to say. Um, cause a, he's going to help me win cause he's Jody queen. I mean, come on, but B he's, he's also, gonna gonna drive the boat. yeah. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. So what are you going to drive the boat? I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll be, I'll be the back angler. I, I don't mind. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's what about I you, had, Ryan? I had time to think about this since I came up with the question and see, I, you know, I was trying to, throw it out there without giving it away too much but like i've got the perfect partner in a in a bass fishing tournament okay i, I said historical right jesus <laughs> jesus is going to be my <laughs> tournament partner it's like oh i don't you know i caught a five pounder but it's the only fish i caught like no we caught five five pounders <laughs> boom <laughs> Well, he's gonna multiply them right there well, yeah you've heard, sure. you've heard the story of he tells you even which side of the boat to throw your yeah. heads on man he knows what's going on yeah i mean y'all can't i i don't care you know i love jody you can't to fish, compete dude, with man. jesus he can't compete <laughs> with jesus you're right he's, you're probably right. In, he's probably in like a group text with the fish and asking where where they're at <laughs> when they're meeting up <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to go get caught again. Oh well, you know <laughs> where, where are we landing. We're, we're coming, Jesus. We're on our way. <laughs> uh, oh my, that's. I mean, that's. I wouldn't have guessed that answer coming from you, but I, hey, that's. I. I'd, I'd what, what's that it. supposed? To, what's that supposed to mean? No, 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 no. Not. Uh, you're not I'm, 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 no, I'm no, no. Even. What, what? No, no. <laughs> uh, but I, I was expecting like a bill to answer. Uh, not, I, my mind did not go there. So. No, I love it, to watch it, it, the dance, break a bait caster, and fall in the lake. I would love that. <laughs> no, <laughs> or his if we trolling motor goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, if we if That's we took amazing. Jesus out of there, I'd probably pick Attila the Hun because he's just going to go in there and like slay some fish. And <laughs> <laughs> you ever watched uh, what's the show? What was it? Turtle Man. Have you guys yeah. ever watched that? What do you oh, mean? Yeah. Have I ever watched that? Be, I feel like, like I laugh all along fishing with him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. If you're gonna, if you want a, an entertaining day on the water, I can think of a million people. Holy cow! Oh, like Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> I would love that. Uh, the blue collar comedy crew would be a blast to fish with. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't think I would get much fishing done, but no. yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't mind know. going out with the tactical sure. passing guys. I feel like you know. I think that would be a, a fun too. If I ever make it out to, well, I guess they're not in California anymore, are they? They're. I think they're on Chickamauga now. No, they're here yeah. in Tennessee. Oh, geez. Yeah. Now I, 
Everybody's going to Tennessee. What the heck? Hey, that's it's fine. It's like a re- YouTube reunion every day on Chickamauga. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's out there. <laughs> heck yeah. Well, Bailey, appreciate you coming on here and talking with us. You know, when I when I originally reached out to you, the plan was for this episode was to just talk trash about Brian Schiller and Josh Smith the whole time. But I th- believe this episode <laughs> turned out to be almost as good as that one would have been. Josh is, Josh is a good dude. Brian, I hate that guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, Josh is a good guy, and Brian is a good guy. But yeah, they're both good Josh, people. Josh likes to give us crap. He calls us the nerds. Josh is a knucklehead, and he uh, <laughs> still th- seems to think that I'm going to give him waypoints for Champlain, which is not going to happen. <laughs> uh, he t- messes me. He goes. He goes. But I right, put my guy. I yeah, I need spots for Champlain. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not giving you spots, dude. He goes, you come around. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's he's good people. He's somebody good to have in your corner. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, He's probably going to hate that we're talking nice about him. Well, we can no, go in. You're talking leave. nice about him. I'm still talking trash. <laughs> I'm still going to go and leave a bad review on this podcast, you know, but. <laughs> Did you guys see that where he asked for people to leave bad reviews? And yeah. Those are hilarious. Yeah, that was really funny. Uh, well, do you want to oh. shout out like where people can follow you with like, social media and sponsors and all that stuff? Heck yeah, yeah. Um, you can obviously follow us um, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, all Serious Angler podcasts. Pretty straightforward there. Um, and uh, we just partnered up with a couple new companies for this year. Um, we partnered up with Outdoorsman Coffee Co. Uh, Frank over at Slay Nation helps out over there. Um, so we, we're working together um, with OCC, uh, which can be pretty sweet because we're going to start giving away uh, two bags of coffee every Monday Night Live episode, which is pretty freaking sweet awesome for the viewers awesome for us and um we partnered up with afco which is huge because like half my probably 80 percent of my wardrobe is already afco so now i could just make it 100 percent. so <laughs> works out great um and then we partnered up with lure lock too which is pretty crucial for us because tackle management is is huge um the one downside with them but i found a, a reverse solution is they're not waterproof but i have the hobie h crate with the waterproof top to it so it doesn't even matter, but it's just one of those things where like that the, the tack logic on there is it helps you stay a little bit more organized on the water, which is huge for kayak guys. But uh, we're working with those fellas. We work with uh, Queen Tackle. Amped Outdoors is a huge contributor to myself and the show. Uh, I'll be sleeping out of my car a bunch traveling this year, and they hooked me up with a, a little battery pack that like uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the Ice Hole Power. That's another brand that works with Amped. It's like battery packs. But basically, it's for my laptop and phone. Stay, I can sleep in my car for like two weeks and pretty much stay charged the entire two weeks, which is super cool. That's and awesome. lithiums are just baller in general. Um, but, yeah, we, we have a lot of good show partners, but um, we have some really good fans, and it's it's a fun time. It's a good show. And, obviously, Paddle and Finn is a, a friend of the show. We've had Brian on before. We've had Brad on before. I talk crap to Brad all the time. Such a, he's a good dude too. Um, which he's been catching some winter hammers down there in Ohio for how much he complains about Ohio. I know he's he's like Ohio fishing sucks. Just look at this twenty incher. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and I, I always give him crap because I'm like, dude, just go up to Lake Erie. There's small ones right there. And he goes, no, that's cheating. And I'm like, <laughs> not cheating when you catch twenty five pounds on Lake Erie and they're all over twenty inches. That's a fun day. Go do it. <laughs> but yeah, no, I appreciate you guys getting me on the show. It's it's been a blast and finally get to talk somewhat face to face. And Ryan, I'm gonna be down in your neck of the woods in about 27, 28 days if you're not sick and wanna link up and go fish something. If if I'm not sick and I'm not working, that would be cool. I do. <laughs> we'll get on we'll get on chick, get after some fish. Maybe run into the tactical bassin guys, you never know. Yeah, maybe go hop on the boat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Won't even ask. We'll just we'll hop <laughs> just roll up beside him and jump over. Yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll get up with my boy Caleb Bell, who's been catching 11, 10 pounders, and we'll get ourselves a, a DD on our hands. That'd be awesome. Uh, you you get with him, you don't even need the tactical bassing guys. You know, nah. I want the hometown heroes. They know the lake the best. Right, right. Yeah. 
Heck yeah, but I appreciate the you letting me come on and be a part of the show. It's it's been a blast. Cool guys. All right. Well, um, everyone, thanks again for listening. This has been the Bass Fishing for Noobs segment of the Paddle and Fitting Podcast, where we bring you the techniques, the tricks, and the tips to help you rip more lips. Thanks and uh, have a good night. Later, y'all. Thanks for tuning in to another killer episode on Paddle and Fin. Don't forget to go check out our website at paddle, the letter N, and fin.com. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel at Paddle and Fin. If you got a question, comment, want to hear from a future guest on a future episode, feel free to email us at paddle, the letter N, and fin at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Paddle and Fin on Facebook and Instagram. Shout out to our show supporters, Angler, the Angler Button, and app just makes for a better time on the water and creates a virtual logbook for every fishing outing out on the water shout out to rocktown adventures located in northern illinois for all your kayaking camping and hiking needs shout out to jig masters jigs when in doubt get the jig out go to jigmasters.com